Buenas tardes, Santiago. Mi, uh, mi español no mejorará uh, hasta un pisco sal. Tal vez dos o tres. Um, so I'll switch to English uh, now for your sake and for mine. Uh, we'll take you through this afternoon a little example of some of the things we see at Singularity University. And we're going to take you on a journey from how quickly technology is moving and then we'll talk about what you can do about it and we'll also see an example of a breakthrough world-changing technology that we're seeing here in Chile. So just a little couple of quick questions for you. How many of you are using a headset? Just so I can just see a show of hands. Okay, a few, no, you're not using a headset. Okay, a few of you. All right. Um, how many of you know a little bit about Singularity University? Okay, some of you. Okay, good. All right, um, next question. How many of you have seen this diagram before? Okay, so in this diagram, there is a dog. Right, does anybody see the dog? So the dog is here, this is its left ear, its head to the ground, this is its left front leg, this is the floor, this is the body of the dog, the back legs. Does everybody see it? Does anybody not see the dog? Alright, let me make it easier, there's the dog. <laughs> Now do you see the dog? Okay, so what, we've, what I've done without your permission is I've actually rewired your brain. So for the rest of your life, when you see this image, you will see the dog. In fact, you can't not see the dog. And we don't know from a neuroscience point of view, we have no idea how this happens. We have no idea how the brain creates a one-way permanent learning that cannot be reversed. Now I did this without your permission. Uh, with your permission, I'm going to, we're going to spend the afternoon and we want you to walk away, ideally, never being able to see technology the same way. Alright? So here we go. Anybody not want to hear that? Okay. Alright. So, um, we are seeing unprecedented acceleration in technology driven by the price performance of computing. So I have a thousand dollar laptop. Ten years ago, I had the equivalent computing power in that laptop of about the brain of an insect. That's how much raw horsepower computing power is in there. Today, we're up to about the brain of a mouse. In 10 years, we'll have the equivalent computing power of one human brain in that laptop. And in about 30 or 35 years, we'll have the equivalent computing power of 8 billion human beings in your $1,000 laptop. Which is an unbelievable, and it's hard to comprehend that amount of technology we're seeing get smaller, faster, cheaper, better. We know that the amount of computing in this device, or in your iPhone, took the size of a building 20 years ago, and in 20 years this will be the size of a blood cell. And the question is, what would we do with that? What would we do with that kind of computing? We have a sense that we don't know where technology is going, but we know exactly how fast your device will be in 3 years, 5 years, or 10 years. What we lack is the imagination as to what we would do with it, and that's what we try and do uh, with with, uh, at Singularity University. Now, this is a graph of the human population and some of the dramatic increases that we've seen. And you can see the incredible increase in population over the last few hundred years. Uh, and the incredible progress in technology just in the last couple of hundred years. The metabolism of the world is increasing, right? And we're seeing this every day. Remember, 10 years ago, we didn't really use social networks or search engines or mobile phones. How different the world is today. How different will it be in 10 years from now? But we've also seen dramatic improvement in our lives because of technology. I've gone the wrong way. Hang on. Um, let's try it again. There we go. So, for example, in the last 100 years, we've seen infant mortality drop very, very dramatically. The cost of telecoms and information has dropped a thousand times. And we're seeing all sorts of other dramatic technologies. Now, I want to show you one of these. Just an example, how many of you are familiar with 3D printing? I see your show of hands. Okay, so about half of you. All right, I'm going to just skip forward here for a second. The 3D printed float is a research project. In. So what you've done, what we've seen here is they're taking uh, 3D software, modeling a flute, and then actually fabricating the flute. So 3D printing is like inkjet printing, but instead of spraying ink, it's spraying a plastic type substance layer upon layer, as you can see it doing here. And it goes long and long, and it takes a little while, one layer, hundredth of an inch at a time, is laying down this capability. 
um, and fabricating from the bottom up uh, an object, whatever we can imagine in our lives. Okay. All right, that's a little boring. Let me skip forward a bit. Here's the fully assembled uh, object, you, you, and then the, the flutist picks it up and plays it. This is a work in progress, and our printed flute is not a... So something interesting is happening here. This is good. This is a, uh, one of our logos. It, this device, this little piece is maybe four or five centimeters tall. And you can notice that there's gears inside there. To make this object traditionally, you have to mold a set of different parts, glue it together, and it's a very time-consuming process to make sure it all fits together. This came out as one piece, and the gears work. Now you can see the resolution there is a little bit, uh, still not so perfect. This was made on a $700 printer. Okay. So these printers uh, used to cost tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They were used by architects and designers to make complex models. Then they were tens of thousands of dollars. That one there is a $2,000 printer. And today, one of those printers can fabricate 70% of the parts to make the next printer. Right? In their estimated in the five or seven years, we'll get to about 98% where the printer can essentially fabricate the next one. And in fact, when you order that particular printer, the first thing you do when you get it home is you print the rest of the parts to finish the printer because it's cheaper that way. And it uses a plastic type substance. Now there's some very dramatic things that have happened in 3D printing. The first is the price. $700 means that in three to five years, like a laser printer used to be very expensive and now everyone has one at home you'll have one in your homes. That is a uh, seven spheres nested one on inside each other, the rattle. And what's interesting here is you cannot mold that. You cannot manufacture that in other, any other mechanism than we can today. And it's one of the inflection points that we try and teach is that for the first time in history, complexity is free. It used to be that if you wanted to manufacture a more complex object, it cost more to make, right? more curves, more angles, etc. Now if you can imagine it in your head, you can print it. This is actually titanium. So we're now at the point where we can fabricate metal. And that's a woman's shoe. So for all you ladies, if you break a heel, you just print a new one. <laughs> this is actually food, and we're now getting to the point where we can fabricate and 3D print food and vitamins into place, and now we're fully into Star Trek material. This image here is a bicycle. They've 3D printed an entire bicycle and then gotten onto the bicycle and rode away. So this, is set, this technology is set to very dramatically change our world. Now what we're seeing is we're taking the world little by little and turning it into information. Right? Via Facebook, all your relationships are now information. Our communications are now analog, not digital, or not, are digital, not analog. Note that for all of you, your memories are in your iPhones or in your Blackberries, they're not in your heads anymore. So you've got a bunch of unemployed neurons in your head looking for work. And so we're turning the world into information at a very dramatic pace. So five exabytes is a very large number, a lot of disks. From the beginning of time to 2003, we as a human race created about five exabytes of information. Two years ago, we created five exabytes of information in two days. And by next year, we'll create five exabytes of information in 10 minutes. So we're seeing an utter explosion in, of information in the world like we've never seen before. And this is dramatically changing the world. Um, I've got here 60 hours of video content uploaded to YouTube every minute. Three months ago, my slide said 48 hours. And now it's 60 per minute. So this is changing incredibly quickly. And what's happening is incredible value is being created. The future of the world is information services. And the more you can manage and navigate and harness that power of that information, the more money you can make. Notice that Google has created a $200 billion company by essentially managing text, right, and now video. Facebook, $100 billion by essentially digitizing your relationships. Groupon and Foursquare attacking the Yellow Pages industry. Thank God, somebody's attacking the yellow pages industry. Um, and now we're set to see a huge amount of information come through via quantified self-health data sensor networks. There are two billion internet-connected devices today on the internet. We expect that within the next 
20 to 30 years could grow to 50 billion. And there are estimates that say by 2050, we will have one trillion connected devices on the internet. Just think about the information that comes through that. Now we pivot around that. We pivot around how can you harness that capability. We're hosted, as Julian and others said, we're based at NASA up in Silicon Valley. Uh, and we pivot around this fundamental idea that the acceleration in information technologies is affecting many other areas. Our two co-founders are Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis. And the key observation from Ray about 20, 30 years ago was that once you information enable any domain or discipline, once you power it with informational properties, it goes into an exponential growth path. It's a very steady doubling pattern, and then you cannot shake it off that path. So for example, this is the price performance of computing, and Ray showed that going all the way back to 1900, that the price performance of computing has been doubling very, very steadily for quite a long time. And his question when he saw this graph, when he put these numbers together, was why is that curve so smooth? Through wars, through recessions, through ups and downs in the semiconductor industry, that is an incredibly steady progression. By the way, it's a logarithmic progression, so that means it's doubling every one of these points, and in fact, more than doubling as you look at this. And he came up with the, the basic observation that you get exponential growth once you information enable a domain. So for example, now that we've sequenced the human genome, medicine is powered by those informational properties and we've seen the cost of gene sequencing go from a billion dollars for the first one to about 400 million for the second to about 50 million for the third, 14 million for the fourth. Does anybody know what it is today to sequence your genome fully? $1,000. So in 12 years, the cost of sequencing your genome, driven by informational properties, has gone from a billion to a thousand dollars. And let me give you an example. If I take 30 steps linearly, one, two, three, four, up to 30, I'll get to the other side of the auditorium, right? And it's kind of easy to picture where would I be one third of the way, where would I be two thirds of the way in that progression. And as human beings, we can imagine that well. If I take 30 steps exponentially, two, four, eight, 16, and I double at every step, at step 30, I'm at a billion, which is very different from 30. I'm 26 times around the world. And it's hard to imagine where am I one third of the way, where am I two thirds of the way along that progression. And as the more and more of the world is being impacted in this exponential way, our future leaders need to be able to project in that format. And so essentially what we try and do is have our students and our participants rethink this. Now if part of the world is growing linearly and part of the world is exponential, then, or the other way around, that causes a lot of stress. And we're seeing that in the Middle East today. Right? Also a lot of opportunity. And we explore that gap. So our core program is this 10 week study a summer program for 10 weeks. And we do a series of executive programs and smaller programs as well. Um, for the 10 week program in the summer, we study these 10 disciplines or 12 disciplines. These core technologies up at the top left, AI and robotics, nanotech and fabrication, networks and computing, biotech, bioinformatics, medicine and neuroscience. These are the core technologies. They're all doubling in their price performance anywhere from 18 to 30 months. And then we look at these areas, how would you manage those technologies and where would you apply them? And for each of those 10 areas or 12 areas, we have a global thinker who orchestrates the curriculum and helps us guide us on what to teach. For example, uh, Dan Berry, who's the head of our faculty, is a three-time space shuttle astronaut. Um, Andrew Hessel, who you heard from later, is one of our gurus, one of the world's top thinkers in synthetic biology. What's attracting to them is you can be a global thinker in nanotechnology, but all of the disruptive thinking happens between the cracks, right? between AI and medicine, or between robotics and manufacturing. We also have guest lecturers, uh, some of the top thinkers in the world, Vince Cerf, who invented the internet, or Craig Venter, who sequenced the first genome that come and speak. We look for students that are at the top of their class academically, have shown academic excellence in one area, have done something leadership oriented, and are interested in global challenges. The students come in at the beginning of the week, of the summer, we give them a little overview of what are the grand challenges. We bring in the Gates Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, the World Bank. We talk about what does it mean, what does uh, clean water or climate change or poverty, what are the aspects, what's been tried, what's failed. The students for then about half the summer get 300 hours of lectures from 160 different speakers <coughs> on what is the future of each of these technologies. What's in the labs today? What's being commercialized tomorrow? Who are the top researchers and thinkers in the space? What products and services do we expect to see out of it? 
The second half of the summer, they work on a project and we turn into an incubator. And this is called the 10 to the 9th plus project. And their challenge is form a team around poverty or around education or clean water and come up with an idea, come up with a product or service that would impact a billion people within 10 years. You have three weeks, off you go. At the end of the summer, we launch these as research initiatives or NGOs or for-profit companies. Here's an example. This team looked at the rise of 3D printing, which I just showed you, the rise of control systems and robotics, which are all moving very, very quickly. And they looked at the construction industry and noticed the way we build houses today fundamentally has not changed in, you know, what, 5,000 years. And so they devised this kind of crane shape, looks like a car wash, with a nozzle at the top running on rails. It will 3D print, it will fabricate a two-bedroom house in about a day and a half, using concrete or adobe or sand if you're in the Middle East. Right? So that's the kind of breakthrough thinking we look for. This team from this last summer looked at poverty and they noticed that most of the roads in Africa get washed out during the wet season. So how do you alleviate poverty if you can't move goods or services around? In the middle of the summer, Chris Anderson from Wired Magazine came and did a talk on drones, these kind of toy quadcopter things that you've seen. And he's creating a whole open source DIY movement around this. And they looked at this and said, hmm, you know, in telephony, much of the developing world skipped over the entire wireline and went straight to wireless. What if you could do that with transportation? Because developing countries won't have the money to put a lot of roads in. And these drones today can carry a two kilogram package several kilometers. So they designed what they call the Matternet, a physical IP address system for things, medicine, food, etc. So imagine a drone picks up a two kilogram package of medicine or food, takes it a few kilometers, drops itself, parks to recharge, the next one picks it up. And what's interesting is the capability of these drones is doubling every 10 months today. So if you layer a solution on top of that, it can actually scale to a global level. This is our very first startup that won the TechCrunch Cup last summer. So we're just starting after three and a half years to see the, the, uh, the model bite. We've spun out about 25 of these startups over the three and a half years in different areas. Um, Larry Page comes and spends time with our students every summer. One of the more interesting attributes of our model is because we focus on the fastest moving technologies, we have to revisit our curriculum very regularly. For example, biotech today is quite different from even a year ago. And three or four times a year, we get our entire faculty together and we revisit every lecture because we have to. Uh, we also do a one-week executive program geared towards the existing leadership of the world. CEOs, investors, government leaders. And we focus here on core technologies and how might this impact their company. If you're the CEO of a major company and you do not know what technologies may come along and impact you, then you're not doing your job. You can see that Kodak today is pretty well dead. Nokia is in major trouble. Blackberry, which is a world leader. I was the head of innovation at Yahoo, which is a dinosaur in its industry after only 16 years because they weren't able to innovate quickly enough. So we look at to get across these areas. We focus on very fast moving change. We know that these, these advances can bring a great deal of abundance. For example, this move from film photography to digital photography has given us an abundance of photographs, right? Maybe too many. Um, we see that these are very disruptive and these technologies are converging as we can see in 3D printing. We look forward. 80% of our curriculum focuses on the future rather than the past. Most academics focus on how did this model evolve, how did this equation develop. We focus most of our academics on our future. And we think about, we think large. We want people to think at a very global level and collaboratively and technologically. So essentially we're creating a, a, a vessel. And into that vessel, we're putting in the top thinkers in the world and the fastest moving technologies, combining that with the most ambitious and accomplished young leadership and existing leadership in the world, and pointing them at the biggest opportunities. Something interesting will happen as you swirl that around. And we're seeing that we're starting to see some results. We've started talking to world leaders about where this is going. I was meeting the Prime Minister of Haiti a couple of months ago. Vivek is regularly meeting with world leaders as well. And the, the, the World Expo that was in Shanghai a couple of years ago will be in Milan in three years, and we're driving a lot of the technology thinking for them. So I want to leave you as we cut across to this next example with an example. How many of you have seen the Google car? Okay, maybe 30% of you. All right. The Google car is a fully autonomous vehicle. The 
US military was trying to build an autonomous vehicle in the 90s. They spent about half a billion dollars in 10 years, and they came up with a car that did maybe 15 kilometers an hour and crashed 60% of the time. <laughs> Not really a good outcome. <laughs> they then decided, let's open it up to a contest. And the first year, all the teams failed. They had to do 100 kilometers through the desert, sorry, 150 kilometers through the des desert, at an average of 50 kilometers an hour. The first year, they all failed. The second year, three teams passed. Google bought the, brought the entire couple of t winning teams on board, and this is the Prius. So I'm going to show you a quick video here of an autonomous vehicle. Wait, do that one more time. Hi, I'm Andrew Chen. And I apologize, there's a little bit of swearing in this. So translators, maybe you don't want to translate this. I don't know how this is. is the right word. Holy shit. Holy shit. There's no fucking hand. We nicked one? That's the second car we've nicked. Yeah! <laughs> so you're not accelerating at all? No. What? Oh, no. <laughs> the first time you get into one of these cars, it's kind of freaky. It's the, the thing takes off at very high speed with no driver. Okay. And the way it works is it uses, it uses LiDAR and creates a three-dimensional image of what's around it and can navigate. Here's the interesting thing about this car. This car has already done 300,000 kilometers on California city roads and highways without an accident. So we project that within the next 10 to 15 years, that we'll see a domination of self-autonomous vehicles, which will be really good for the drinking law that was passed here in Chile a couple of weeks ago, so it seems to be a real pain in the ass. We also can estimate uh, that the that we'll never need parking lots because you the car will drop you off and just go wait somewhere. And you won't have rush hour traffic, thank God. My God, Santiago rush hour traffic seems to be terrible. Um, we've estimated that the capacity of existing roadways with no change in infrastructure will increase maybe 15 times once you have these cars fully in place. And the state of Nevada in the US has already passed a law authorizing the use of these cars once they get to the right technical specs. So I've given you a couple of examples of what the type of thing that we're seeing happening. Um, we're going to see a few more this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, Peter Diamandis, our founder, says if you, the best way of predicting the future is to create it. In fact, I, we would actually extend that and say the only way of predicting the future is to create it.